In this interview episode, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Rocky Lalvani, the Profit Answer Man of ProfitComesFirst.com, where he guides business owners on how to keep and enjoy the profit they deserve from their business. Rocky is the prime example of what it looks like to build a wealthy lifestyle out of nothing. His parents brought him to America with just $25 when Rocky was just three years old. He began saving, investing, and smart spending as a young newspaper delivery boy and eventually retired from a successful pharmaceutical sales career to help small business owners use money effectively through profit-first methods in their business. Today, Rocky's main interests include rental real estate and flips, karate, the personal finance community, shout out to FinCon, and of course, helping business owners flip the equation on how cash flows through their business. Rocky, thanks so much for being here with me today. I want to start out with a little bit about your beliefs as far as what abundance means to you. I think for me, it's time freedom, um, along with financial freedom. So the ability to do what you want, when you want, how you want on your terms. And, and having that be available. Yeah. Um, was that always your perspective on abundance or was there a time where your belief of what abundance was or what it looked like was different? I think at a younger age, it was all financial. Mm. Not really realizing all the other parts of it Yeah. and the different areas to that kind of tie into that. Um, so I think it was a much more limited perspective from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. Did your upbringing affect the way you operated either toward or away from abundance? Like, was there any mindset barriers that you had to overcome? In our family, we talked about money. So it wasn't a taboo topic. I didn't realize that not everyone else talked about money. But at the same point, a lot of things were then measured against money. So coming back to abundance was more a dollar amount than a freedom of time or looking at the other parts of life, uh, such as health and relationships and all of that other type of, of area. Most things are judged financially, right? People look at people who are rich. They don't look at them and go, oh, that guy's rich. He doesn't, he has all this time. It's, oh, he has all this money. And you don't know all the underneath things that are going on there. And, and I think that's why you will see a lot of people who have a lot of money are unhappy. They got a whole bunch of other problems. So they don't have that kind of abundance mentality. At the same point, they may have money and they might be Scrooges, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so again, I, I think it's much more than that. Absolutely. How have you intentionally structured things to align with your perspective of, of abundance, which is time freedom? So I've reverse engineered my business to suit me and not me to suit my business. So generally, I will never have phone calls before 9 a.m. It's very rare. I'm usually done by 5. If I do podcasts, I do those sometimes in the evening just because. But like Monday mornings are slow start. Friday afternoon, you know, I want to be done early. So I know the time that I need. And then we've learned the concept of how much is enough. And it's not like chasing more and more and more and more and more. It's, hey. This is enough and I'm okay with this and I don't need more to be happy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Can you help get into the details of what reverse engineering for someone's lifestyle might look like? You can use yourself or you can use an example. 
but how someone would say, okay, this thing is what's important to me. And then what are the steps? How do they reverse engineer their lifestyle or their business to fit what they want? Two different parts to that business and life. You have to begin with the end in mind. So if you haven't defined the end, you can't technically reverse engineer it. Most people don't know what they want, don't define the end, or haven't taken the time to do that. When you take the time to do that, now you can start to say, is this taking me towards or away from what I want? And then decisions start to become so much easier. For the business, it's like, how much money do I need to live? And how much time do I want to work? Well, that tells you between the two, this is the math equation. This is what you're going to have to do in order to achieve that. And then you can say, well, is that possible? Is it not possible? And how do I become the person that makes that possible? And then setting those hard parameters and borders and sticking to them, especially with business owners, right? Oh, I made I made this much money. Now I need to make more. Why? It's very hard, I think, for a lot of people to say this is enough and stick to it. We get sidetracked and then you wonder why you're on the hamster wheel again because you got busy. <laughs> for me, thinking about reverse engineering it, I'm, I'm a numbers person, so it would end up being like, okay, how much do I actually need to live off of and want for retirement? Doing the math equation to discover what that means I need to earn or invest that year. Both of those things, right? Living expenses and the investments. So that's my bring home income that I need. And then from there, okay, if that's my bring home income, then how much does the business need to make to support that bring home income for me? So that could get more complicated or not, but that's like the basics of where my mind goes when I think about how much is enough. Maybe I don't need a $10 million revenue business per year, right? Like maybe I don't need that. Might be cool. But maybe I could reach my goals having a $3 million business, right? But then there's nothing wrong with wanting that $10 million business. It just depends, right? Well, you have to define that for yourself and then decide, do you want to do the work to have that result? The funny thing is, though, I can show you a $3 million business, a $10 million business, and a $100 million business. And the owner takes home the same amount of money, right? Because most people are being busy, not being smart about how they do things. And those are the conversations we have a lot. It's incredible to look at different businesses and see what the actual take home is. And I think it's quite shocking. That's a perfect segue. So yes, your business is called Profit Comes First. And I see the Profit First book there behind you. I just reread it over the holidays. I've been using it in my business for years. And I know that Mike Michalowicz has a couple of videos on your website sharing <laughs> about you and your work. So talk to me a little bit more because I bet that statement surprised some people about a $3 million, $10 million, and $100 million business, the owner taking home roughly the same amount in some cases. So talk to us more about your business and what you see there and how, how could that equation possibly be true? I think what happens for many business owners, when you've got a little bit of excess money and you've got a problem, you start throwing money at problems. Or you start to grow, well, I need this and I need that. And for a lot of businesses, they essentially build an overhead mechanism that costs a lot, a lot of money. And they, they keep allowing it to grow. And if they haven't built it with thought or systematically or efficiently, then at the end of the day, it's going to be an issue. And that's the reality of it. And I don't think most business owners don't look at their finances. 
So they've got no idea what's going on. And if you have no idea what's going on or what the score is, well, then you can't improve it. Yeah. So that's kind of problem number one. It's not a measurable <laughs> metric at that point. So it's how do not you know? A, <laughs> how do you know? And I think there's always the I'll be profitable when. Mm. Right. Just like I'll be happy when. Right. And so business owners keep reinvesting in the business, but they don't get a return on their reinvestment. It's just wasted money. Maybe it's a vanity spend. Maybe it's they tried something and it didn't work out. I think too often we build too big for what we truly need. And each business is different. I can show you clients in the same industries. One of them's taking home a lot of money. One of them's not. And I've got clients who, I'm just thinking of two off the top of my head. One of them's taking home a lot, a lot, a lot of money. And the other one's got more sales and isn't taking home anywhere near that amount of money. So it's how you build your business model and the intention you put into it and learning not to listen or do what everyone else does. And I think that's where people, if they don't understand the numbers, they can't make the wisest decisions. Especially at the beginning, it's all, oh, I need sales, so I'll spend money on marketing. Nobody knows which marketing is bringing the return. So they spend a lot of money and they don't see anything for it. And a lot of people are afraid to do what really needs to be done, which is to knock on doors and pick up the phone and call people. <laughs> you know, good old fashioned sales. Yep. Have you ever pictured yourself having your own show? Maybe it's time. This show is edited and produced by podcastabundance.com. And if you like what we're doing, we can do it for your business too. I'm Virginia Elder, and I've been helping entrepreneurs start podcasts to market their business since 2019. I coach you through branding, structuring your episodes, workflow, and recording your podcast then my team and I professionally edit your audio and video so that you don't have to. We'll even write your episode descriptions and titles so that when potential customers turn to Google, your show appears in their search results. Establish authority in your niche, expand your reach, and create a library of helpful content for potential and current clients all with your own podcast. I'm here to hold your hand and make podcasting the exciting, up-leveling experience it should be. Skirting you past the tech and software struggles too. Take the first step by booking a call with me using the link in the show notes or by visiting podcastabundance.com. Now, on to the rest of the show. Okay, so you hit on a lot of great points there. And something that came to mind was, did you see this conundrum in businesses or in your own business before you learned about Profit First and got certified? Or did Profit First come first? And then you were able to say, okay, I can really see how this would work. Like, was it the chicken or the egg? <laughs> Which way was it? The principles in Profit First, mm -hmm. I've been doing my whole life. Ah. But I was doing it on the personal finance side. Okay. I didn't realize that business owners weren't understanding the business of business. And then it was kind of the aha of, oh, they went into business to do what they loved. Accounting wasn't on the list or the finances weren't on the list. And that really kind of opened my eyes. And, and as part of that journey, profit first came into the equation. And I started looking at that. And I looked at other systems. There's, there's other systems out there and other things. And 
that was the one that fit best for me. And it was one that I already was doing and living. So it just made natural sense for me to go through their certification and build my business using that model because it was a perfect fit. Regarding Profit First, if anybody's listening and they have no idea what we're talking about, it's a book. Get it on Audible. Read it. Check out Rocky's site. It is a system, but there's rigidity and flexibility within that system. And so I highly recommend it. Like you said, there are other systems, but (laughs) I would encourage listeners to, like you're saying, Rocky, look at your numbers. Like, don't be afraid of them. I think that's such an important part of a business owner's journey. But then also, if abundance is even a thought on your radar, like you said, initially, eh, maybe it has a lot to do with money or income or wealth. But in time, I feel like once you solve a certain number of problems, you start to open your eyes and say, it means more than that. It's health. It's time. It's the freedom to do what I want (laughs) at the time I want, like you're saying with your schedule. So I am curious about, Rocky, in your business, were you able to implement Profit First immediately? And were there any bumps along the way? Because I'm partnered with Profit First, it's a requirement. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so you had, I mean, it, it, you were required to, and I did. Now, I will say Profit First works in any business at any stage. However, it has to be adapted. And that's where the difference is. In the startup stage, if you don't have revenue coming in, you can't allocate profit. But what you can do is separate your startup capital and be very cognizant of how quickly your startup capital is disappearing. And at the same point, the first time you get a dollar in revenue, start allocating it using profit first. And so it's kind of that slow switch from burning capital. But in the meantime, you're building the profit habit. And so you can do that. Now, some businesses don't need startup capital or maybe very small amount, in which case you don't have to worry about that. You just as soon as you start having revenue come in, you just start allocating it. Leading back to the abundance piece and the business owner's journey. There are a set number of profit first accounts that you set up initially, right? But then there's some flexibility. You can set up additional accounts toward other things, marketing, whatever that needs to be for your business. Share with us some potential options, maybe, that they could do that might help them feel more abundant. Let's kind of look at this through a slightly different lens. Most business owners struggle to pay themselves. They're always afraid, can I take money out of the business? Can I do this? Can I do that? Allocating money to these accounts with a purpose in mind, I think it takes a lot of that negative emotion out of it. It's like, okay, I've allocated the money to my pay account, and I've been doing this for three months. You know what? The money's building up. There's excess there. I can start paying myself. And they become more emotionally okay with doing those types of things. And I think that's the biggest problem for a lot of business owners. It's that struggle of how much can I take out of the business and when? And is it appropriate? And then there's the other end of the spectrum where they spend it all before they get a chance and they get themselves in trouble. But you know, they I'm already sure knew you've that. seen both sides of that. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen both sides of it. What this does is it gives you a framework to do what you said you're going to do. Absolutely. Talk to me about the abundance shift that you've experienced over the past four or five years. Then I would like to hear about a couple of shifts you've seen in clients 
support abundance? The shift has been longer than a few years. I think once I achieve the financial numbers and you look around, you go, wait a minute. Well, the skies didn't open up that, you know, there's no, you're still not happy beyond belief. There's no angels singing. It's not a perfect life. That's when you start to say, okay, I'll be happy when, and, and you hit the when, you had the money, something's wrong. Let's go in search of all of that. And so I think that was kind of more that aha that occurred long before I started the business. But what a business does is it allows you, if you're good at it, to have control over your earnings and your ability. People think businesses are risky. You know, there's nothing more risky than working for someone else and they walk in one morning and go, bye, see you, we changed our mind. And now how are you going to make a dollar tomorrow? You got to go find a job and maybe the economy's bad at the moment or maybe what you were doing is no longer a viable option because the world changed. Or maybe you've got a health problem. And There's a million things that happen in life. When you run your own business, you have the freedom to decide what you want to do on your terms and to do them on your terms. When it comes to your daily habits or practices, share with us some things that you've implemented that made all the difference for you? When it comes to exercise, right? I I know what days I do what, right? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I go to the gym. Tuesday, Thursday, I, I do it at home. I have programs and apps, so I don't have to think about what I'm going to do. You want to take all the thought out. You want to have the systems and processes in place, and then you just go follow them. So I know what I'm going to do when I go to the gym. I've got an app for it. It's got timers on it to keep me on track. You know, if if I want to increase weights or do all of that, it helps to do all of that for me. And in the past, to build those habits, I had trainers. I had people help me to get into those rhythms. I had accountability groups. I did all of those things until it became a normal habit. I also track my food. So, you know, I weigh everything that I eat. I can see on a given day what my carbs are, what my fat is, what my protein is. My phone tracks my sleep. My blood pressure automatically gets updated. I step on a scale. It automatically shows up. Everything gets put into one place. Apple Health will keep track of it. You can put overlays on top of it to get better results from it. Actually, right now on the back of my arm is a a continuous glucose monitor. I don't have diabetes, but I want to see how different foods affect my body and what are the results that it's causing. So I'm using technology to fine tune my behaviors and to see what's happening with regards to them. But it takes time. It takes effort. It takes, uh, I have found And I guess I didn't realize this, but for most people, they just won't consistently do stuff. Yeah. I mean, that literally you have to build the habits and the consistency and then just go do it. And when you have that, you don't have to think. And so it takes away all the mental chatter. Yeah, because I think that's the biggest thing you can say. I'm going to start this workout routine, whatever it is. And three days in, you're like, in your head, I don't want to get up. I don't, I'm sore. I don't want to do it. Oh, where are my shoes? I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, just whatever the thing is, it's just mental chatter, like you said. And typically it's discouraging. It almost never is encouraging. So those habits and being able to really, I love what you said. I mean, everything sounds so systematic for you. That's pretty amazing. So I know that somebody's listening going, holy cow, like, I don't even know where to start. How do you even start to have systems at this level? Just start. Pick one area and tie to something that you're already doing. So, you know, it's funny because I think in the book, Mike tell his story. Maybe he just tells it. He's like, I wanted to start running. So he said... I put my sneakers on the toilet. 
So he gets up in the morning, he goes to the bathroom, he picks up his sneakers, he's like, oh, I got my sneakers in my hands, let me put them on my feet. You know, you lay out your clothes, you keep everything ready, and then you can start and go. And that's literally what it comes down to. Um, BJ Fogg is a big habits guy. And he's like, you know, if you want to start flossing your teeth, anchor it to something. So after brushing my teeth, I am going to floss one tooth. I'm not going to go wild and crazy. We're just going to do one. We do the same thing with profit first. People are like, I'm not sure if I can do this. I go open one bank account, put 1% in it. Slowly build your habits. So take tiny habits and little by little, they stack. Once you start a gym habit, you'd be shocked at how many people who start a gym habit start a financial habit. Oh, yeah. They go hand right? in hand. It's amazing. It's amazing. So once you start this habit stacking, if you keep it up over time, you will achieve it. Some people need accountability. So create accountability. Find somebody or create a group or do something to be able to create the accountability. The other thing is I think everyone's looking for perfect. So if I'm injured, I still go to the gym. If my arms are injured, I can still do stuff with my legs. There have been times where for six months I had a shoulder or something out of whack. I would go to the gym and I would still bench. But instead of loading it up with weights, I would just bench an empty bar. And I'm like, I'm going to sit here and I'm going to keep doing this habit. At least make effort towards it. Maybe I can't do what I used to do. Maybe I'll do a half of what I used to do or a quarter. At least I'm going to make the habit of continuing to do it even if. And I think that's a big part of it. As long as you're keeping the streak. You'd be fine. Oh, I love that. Because even I made a face when you said, like, even if I'm injured, I still go to the gym. And it, like in the back of my mind, I could hear like, what? You know, because so many people stop. When I was in that first accountability group for working out, they had a very simple rule. To be in this group, you had to work out three times a week. All these crazy people would come into the group and set a goal of, I'm going to work out seven days a week. And they would all fail. because. It was too big a goal. And I said, I'm going to work out three days a week, and my stretch goal is five. And I always hit it. And I would say, I'm on vacation this week. I am not going to work out. That's my goal. So I set a goal to not work out, and I followed it. Or I would say, hey, I'm on vacation this week. I have no idea what the gym looks like at the hotel. But whatever it is, I'm going to go there three times, then I figure out something, and I'll do my best. People set these really high goals that they can't reach, and they set themselves up for failure. On that note, is there a way to measure or to realize that the goal that you set is too high or too stringent? I mean, when you say, okay, work out seven days a week, that is crazy. Like, I can tell you that goal is not going to happen. But what about when it comes to business goals, right? Or lifestyle, like time blocking your sequence of your day type of goals. Like, how do we know when we're being too ambitious? If you haven't done it before, it's too ambitious. And, and I don't mean you haven't done it. In other words, if I don't do time blocking, I'm not going to start by time blocking the entire week. I'm going to start by time blocking an hour, maybe three days a week to do X. And that's what you're going to work on. And it's the same thing. Start small and let it build. Because when you start winning, you're going to continue to win. So if you want to start a habit of running, just say, look, I'm going to start with around the block. I'm not going to go 13 miles my first time out. Once you get around the block, eh, well, all right, I'll go again. And you start to build it that way. So I think the biggest thing is just to start small and then keep working from there. I agree. And I think that's such good advice 
and we've heard it before, but we forget it. Like every time we go to start a new thing and or assess goals or look at what I'm going to do in the next quarter for my business, whatever, we just forget that. And we try to be really ambitious because maybe for whatever reason, we feel that we need that milestone. What I would like to hear about is the beginning of your podcasting journey. Go way, way back because I know you're a very experienced podcaster. And talk to me about how you started Simple or if you did, or if you were a bit too ambitious at the beginning, like talk to me about what that looked like for you. I missed my first deadline entirely. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I set a second deadline. Okay. And even that was a bit of a struggle. And it's funny because, you know, I set this deadline and you, know, you want to talk about people not doing anything. You know who Seth Godin is? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I I was at Seth's event. We're live in New York City with him. Maybe 300 people in the audience. We had a chat channel, and he, he does all kinds of wonderful things. Yeah, he's and impressive. And this one coach who was there said, hey, I'll coach any five people here for free. Okay. Give them a session. Well, how many people you think signed up? I would think a lot, but maybe none. You would think a lot. Two was me and some other guy. <laughs> wow. Talk about and a missed opportunity. Talk about a missed opportunity, right? So we sign up for this guy to help coach me. And I was like, hey, these are all my things that I got to get done. And I need the podcast out and blah, 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 blah. He just helped me block it out, plan it out and do it. It took me a while to because I planned out my first 10 episodes, I think. So that took a long, long time to do. But then I hit record and we just started knocking them out so that we had momentum going into it. And I announced I was going to do it. So then I had to publicly. And then I started lining up my first few guests. You know, in the beginning, it was... There's fear, right? There's this, there's worry. I would show up half an hour early, make sure all the equipment was working. Everything's put. Now I show up two seconds before. Hit record. Let's go. Right. But I've been doing it so much now that I don't worry about all that stuff anymore. In the beginning, you do. And so I planned it out and then I started doing it. And you just keep going. And again, I'm a person who, hey, this is what we're going to do. This is when we're going to release. So the other thing is I'm usually two to three months recorded out. Because if something goes wrong, I don't have to worry about it. If I'm away for four weeks, I don't have to worry about it. So it's the other thing is planning out in the head so that there's no tension and all of that coming up on it. Absolutely. Well, thank you because you just backed up what I always tell my new podcasters that are launching for podcast abundance. And we have extensive conversations of, in the beginning during the launch process about um, how to plan out to get ahead because you get sick, the kids get sick, something happens. You have aging parents, like whatever is going on, things happen in life and you need the freedom to be able to take a couple weeks and go handle whatever it is and not be stressing out that you let down your audience essentially because that's not a good feeling. That's like being stood up on a first date, right? It's like, like, oh my God, where's this person? I thought they were, you know, committed to this. Um, so thank you. That's a big piece of it. Would you mind going into how you get so far ahead and how you plan out these batch recordings or, or what your method is. We started with the first nine planned. And then we had the first couple interviews scheduled. So that was kind of getting it started. Now, you know, I keep an Excel sheet, which is, hey, you know, what's been recorded, 
where are we at in the process? How many do I need to book? And then I go in waves. Like, I might not answer an email for two, three weeks for guests. And then I'll be like, oh, where are we at on backlog? All right, I need to go approve a bunch of guests. You know, they book when they book. And also, I'm busy. I don't want anyone booking too close in. So most of my stuff is booked out. Guests are usually three weeks to maybe two to three months out. You got a big guest. They might book out three months because you got to get scheduling to do all of that. And so as long as you just keep feeding the system, it keeps going. And every so often I check in, hey, are we too far ahead or too far behind? And then we take care of it. This perspective, I'm sure everybody can tell, is definitely from someone who has a team behind the scenes who's handling it for them. And that's who you're checking in with, with your spreadsheet. I also love that you're just using a spreadsheet. You're not using some complicated software that you had to buy. And I think that's a big piece of it. Just like the goal setting options we were talking about, it's so natural to make things too complicated from the get-go. And to think that to start, I have to have this and this and this and this, and I have to buy these things and this costs $5,000. Well, no. (laughs) Start with a free spreadsheet. And maybe it took you time to hire the team, or maybe you had a team from the get-go. But I would love for you to talk about the outsourcing piece. I think most entrepreneurs don't outsource enough. What's your perspective on that? I prefer systems to outsourcing. Our editing is outsourced. All of the scheduling is literally, I get a pitch. If I like the person or I want them, I just hit reply and I hit four keystrokes and it automatically drops in the template of Yes, you're approved. Here's a link. Send me your bio and your headshot. And then they go find time on my calendar. And they book it out. And I don't have to worry about it. And then I just add them to the spreadsheet. I have someone now, though, that helps more with all the social media and some of the behind the scenes stuff that I used to do more so myself. But we started with the most basics. And little by little, we just keep adding to it and improving it. But I don't think you have to fuss. I think people fuss too much and they do too much. What's the minimal viable that I need to do to make this work? Mm -hmm. Can you share any, whether it's about the podcast or about the business, any big mistakes or any time that you felt misaligned or not abundant? The hardest thing for me to do is the first step. And if I don't do the first step, it'll sit there and not get done. But the moment I do the first step, it doesn't matter how messy it was, things start moving in a direction. And then we figure the rest out. And then it's like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Why was I worried about that? And that's kind of the key. And the other thing is ask for help, right? In the beginning, it's really complicated, but now it's all super easy. I like that. So one last question before we wrap up. I would like to hear about how you've grown and your personal development as a podcaster, like how having a podcast has forced you to grow? Over time, the quality of your guests keeps going up and up. And so it starts to become incredible. Hey, wait, who pitched me about coming on my show? <laughs> and and that, that happens um, over time. The other thing is to keep improving and to have conversations. Let's face it, there's good podcasts and there's bad podcasts. I think bad podcasts are the ones that are formulaic 
They ask the same six questions of every guest. It's not a conversation. They haven't done their homework to know what to even talk about. And so I think that's a big part of it. It's just kind of getting it down. But yeah, I think over time, you just it's building confidence in knowing that you can have the conversation studying how to do it better. Like, go listen to the best podcast. What is the host doing? How do they do things? And who do I want to emulate in the way that I do my show? Like, I always pre-prep, so I have tons of questions ready to roll on the particular subject. And we also do guest research and all of that so that you're going in knowing what you want to kind of accomplish. And, And the other thing is having a good first question to get the conversation moving because once it gets moving it'll keep going i agree and do you think the show has or both of your podcasts really because let's be clear you have two very long-running shows how have they affected your business because one of them specifically is really tailored toward profit comes first And then the other one is more about life beyond money and that abundance mindset. So how have they attracted clients to your business? So it does both. A, it's lead gen. Like people show up on my calendar ready to buy. If they've listened to the podcast, chances are I've been in their head for 10, 20, 30 hours or longer. And so that creates that connection where they know, like, and trust you. You don't know who they are (laughs) because they just showed up. And so from that standpoint, it's great. The second thing is networking ability. Again, with a podcast, you get to interview people that wouldn't normally talk to you. It gives you that credibility Mm -hmm. kind of just even if you didn't feel like you were somebody, you're suddenly somebody. Correct. You get a lot of great guests over time. And so it opens up those types of opportunities. You know, for me, they told me originally, well, you got to write blogs. And I just was horrible at writing blog posts. Was it my strength? Podcasting played more to my strengths. It was something I was more apt to do. And so it seemed to work much better for me. And in the meantime, blogs, I don't know, are blogs still a thing? I guess they are. They are. I think they'll go through a low period right now while audio and video is so hot. But in the end, I think they're going to have a longstanding importance. And I think they'll go through different revivals over time because it still comes down to SEO, which your podcast does help with. YouTube helps with, right? But blogs go on your website. So they're still out there. There's different posts of, I read something about like, is blogging dead? (laughs) So, but I like what you said about playing to your strengths. If you're more comfortable having a conversation than you are coming up with a topic and writing about it, well, then that should help lead you toward how you'll market your business and what tools you'll use rather than forcing yourself into a box because everybody's doing it. So that's another like trick or habit toward abundance, right? Like doing what you're good at. And if you feel forced to do something you're not good at, well, maybe that's a piece you outsource. So Rocky, I really, really appreciate you being here with me today. Will you share a bit about your website, your shows, where to follow you, find you, and how people can reach you? Before I do that, can I ask them a favor? Yes. So wherever you are, wherever you're listening, there's this like button. You're supposed to hit it. Show a little (laughs) love, right? (laughs) I love it. (laughs) And if you think there's somebody else who might appreciate the conversations that Virginia is having, share. Again, just nice way to to give a little love. After that, if you want to come find me, the website is profitcomesfirst.com. You can find links to everything on that site and to the podcasts and everything else. Thank you so much, Rocky. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here. I had a great time chatting with you. Thanks so much for having me.